Now, I will be chairing the meeting tonight, and uh, this EFDD meeting, the EFDD is the uh, group in the European Parliament to which UKIP belongs, and it's my particular pleasure to welcome, first of all, to the rostrum, a giant of Eurosceptic newspaper columns and campaigning down the years. Uh, a man who tells me he actually leafleted as a schoolboy in the referendum in 1975 and has kept the Eurosceptic flame alive in the media in thin times and in high times too. And I would say the doyen of Eurosceptic journalists in this country. It's my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Simon Heffer. Patrick, thank you for that wonderful introduction, the checks in the post. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't want to sound like the late Max Bygraves, but I want to tell you a story. Exactly a year ago today, I was in Geneva. I hadn't committed a crime. I was there of my own volition. I was asked to go there by the, something called the Anglo-Swiss Chamber of Commerce. And these are British businessmen who live in Geneva, and uh, good for them, make a great deal of money out of doing what they do in Geneva. And I was asked to go and speak about what was then the forthcoming general election. And I did. I didn't speak about the great issue that concerns us this evening. But a man in the back looking very expensive in a very expensive suit and with a very expensive wig, I thought, on, put up his hand and said, Mr. Heffer, I've read some of your columns over the years, and I was about to thank him for that. And he said, I really hate the fact that you are so rude about the European Union. So I took a deep breath. I forbore from asking him whether he'd ever thought of having a mind of his own. That would have been pointless. But I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And he said, well, don't you see that our country, I wasn't sure whether he meant Switzerland or Britain, but I think he meant Britain. Our country is finished if we leave. Business is over. We can't survive commercially. So I said two things to him. I said, first of all, I'm, I admire your um, support of our country, which you show by living in Switzerland. <laughs> and I said, second, since I arrived here yesterday evening and I've walked around Geneva, I hadn't been to Geneva for some years and I wanted to have a look at it. I said, I have been deeply affected by the sights of grinding poverty that I've witnessed almost everywhere in this city, a city that is, of course, in a country that's not in the European Union. Um, some of my audience had the good manners to laugh at that remark. He looked very upset. But it gave me a taste a year ago of what we're now calling Project Fear, the determination by our masters, our political elite, who are as one with the political elite of Europe and who are determined that their cosy little club, their cosy little anti-democratic club, their cosy little anti-democratic club that treats us all like naughty children is going to survive irrespective of what the people of this country think. And you only have to look back through the 43 or so years that we've been in what's now called the EU, and indeed the whole 60 years of its existence since the Treaty of Rome in 1956, to see that it is a profoundly anti-democratic organization. It's one that treats what it calls ordinary people with complete contempt. And you only have to think of the people that we have sent there uh, supposedly to argue our case for us, such political titans as Neil Kinnock and Chris Patton and Peter Mandelson, to see the sort of people who have no regard whatsoever for people like us, who have no conception of what it's like to live in this country, to try and make a living, to try and be decent, hard-working people, keeping a family together, as they are chauffeured around, as they live off their EU pensions when they retire. EU pensions which, of course, have a condition of receipt that they never criticize the European Union as long as they live. These people have no conception of what life is like and no conception of why many of us, having had this utterly anti-democratic rule from Brussels, no longer wish to be a part of it. I am deeply distressed at the contempt that these people have for, the, for, the, for what they consider to be the ignorance of us. They think they can tell us one lie after another. We've had the idea that the whole of the South Downs will be turned into a refugee camp. 
We've had the whole of the city of London decamping and going off to Frankfurt. We've had agriculture closing down. Uh, I, I mean, fisheries have already largely closed down, as Patrick said, and that's despite being in the EU. I don't know what lie is going to come next. Plagues of locusts, maybe uh, other biblical metaphors, maybe we'll have 40 years of flooding or something if we decide to leave the EU. I would put nothing past these people. We have to start showing them that we are beyond being frightened and that all we're interested in is proper, coherent arguments. Now, I'm not in any doubt at all that the business and enterprise of this country, which is fostered by the hard work and the ability to take risks of the people of this country, will survive and go from strength to strength the day that we decide to leave. It is absolute nonsense to say that this country is going to cease to be a serious commercial power. We are the fifth biggest economy in the world if we decide to leave the European Union. And so as you have this torrent of lies over the next three months that we simply cannot survive outside the so-called single market, it's quite simple. Don't believe them. It's a complete lie. What worries me even more, though, is if we make the mistake of voting to stay in. The day after that vote, what are they storing up for us? Is that the day when they say, oh, by the way, we forgot to tell you you're taking a quota of... Um, of, of people from Somalia or Syria? Is it the day when they say, actually, we are going to open our borders to 75 million Turks? Is it the day that they say, we need you to help us bail out Greece because it's going to be terribly embarrassing if the euro goes down the lavatory? Who knows what they've got stored up for us? None of this is going to be said during the campaign. But we know it's true because the history of this movement over the last 43 years that we have been associated with it, is every year that goes past, we are asked to swallow more and more things for which we've never voted and upon which we've never been consulted. Now, this gets to the heart of it for me. I don't believe that we'll be any worse off. Indeed, I believe we'll be much better off economically if we get out. There's a whole world out there to trade with. There's about 200 countries that are not in the European Union, many of them quite sophisticated, many of them with good things to sell us and good things they want to buy from us. So I don't see that these lies have any credibility whatsoever. But, you know, even if I was convinced that on the day that we decide to leave, the managing director of BMW will telephone the Department of Business and say, we've decided not to sell you any more cars or the people who run the champagne companies of France ring up and say, we're not going to sell you any more booze. If I, even if I thought that was going to happen, even if I was told that the, all these markets, these other 27 countries, would be closed to us, and that we'd all be cutting down trees to heat our houses, rather as the Greeks are now, or putting our children into care in order to have them fed, rather as the Greeks are now, in the EU, I would still want to leave. And it's quite simple why. I don't like being treated like a naughty child. I don't like being infantilized by people in Brussels. And I don't like being told that what these people do, they will continue to do, and it won't matter a damn whom I vote for at the next election. I get the same policy, whether I vote Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, if they still exist, or whoever. It's not good enough. We're too grown up as a nation and too sophisticated as a people to be infantilized in this way. I don't want to be treated like a naughty child, but when I'm told how I must vote because my country is going to cease to exist as I see it, and I know that these people are having to reduce themselves to lying and scaremongering in order to try and force people to vote, I have nothing but contempt for them, and I know that their arguments must be wrong. Now, I understand that there are many people in this country who avoid politics. I quite understand that. The political class, generally speaking, possibly with the exception of Patrick and Nigel Farage, is pretty horrible. And why wouldn't you avoid it? But this is a rare moment. It's a once-in-a-generation moment. For many people here who are under the age of, uh, of 58, as I still just about am, it's the only time we've ever had a chance and maybe the only time we ever get a chance to vote on this. And this is a crucial moment for us all to engage with politics. And it's a crucial moment to think about what being British really means. 
And what it means to me is that my father and grandfather fought in two world wars, and generations before them in the 19th century fought to get a vote. And that vote, that right to participate in our society, that right to hold those who rule us to account, is crucial to me and is central to my identification as an Englishman. And it's something that we've had in this country now for generations. We're not like so many of those European countries who, within living memory, were under dictatorships. We haven't had that misfortune. And we have a legacy in this country. We have a history and a tradition of running ourselves. And actually, do you know, we made rather a good job of it. So I plead with you. That's why I'm going to vote to come out on the 23rd of June. I may well here be preaching to the converted, but many of your friends won't be converted. And they're the people that you need to go out and see and talk to and say, think about what it is to be British. Think about that legacy, that history, that tradition of self-determination, of freedom, of liberty, of that ability to hold our rulers to account, of that ability to have our vote at every election make a difference. This is not a life and death matter. This is not quite 1914 or 1940, but it's as far, it's as close to it as you can get without firing weapons. This really is about our future. It really is about our liberty. It really is about our freedom. And it's about our ability to be grown up as a nation, as an old and great nation like this really should be. My family came to Cambridgeshire from Holland 550 years ago, we were thrown out because we had the audacity as Dutchmen to become Protestants when Holland was run by the Catholic King of Spain. And he was told by the Pope, don't just not tolerate these people, kill them. And we came here to a village just outside Ely 550 years ago and settled here and we enjoyed what were then the much more restricted freedoms of this country, but this country, as it's done for generations of refugees and immigrants ever since, gave us shelter and allowed us to live here and thrive in that atmosphere of freedom and liberty. All I'm asking you is when we get to the 23rd of June, make sure you have got as many people as possible to understand that tradition, to understand how important it is to us, and to turn out and vote for us to leave the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you.